Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 607 of the podcast and it's Sunday the 27th of February 2022 as I record this. On today's show, I talk to Johnny B. Truant about the creative pivots he has taken from a PhD in genetics to copywriting, blogging and course creation to non-fiction for authors, events and the self-publishing podcast and now to a prolific fiction writer with over 100 books and a TV show in production right now. I've known Johnny online since around 2008-2009 when I bought one of his courses, Question the Rules, at a time when I was wondering why the hell the publishing industry was so slow. (laughs) I wanted to self-publish, but it went against the traditional model in so many ways, and I was worried about that at the time. (laughs) Johnny's positive self-help allowed me to see that I could question the rules and self-publish, and then several years later, he followed the indie path as well. Now, if you've been around in the indie author space for a good few years, you will know Johnny, Sean and Dave from the self-publishing podcast as it used to be, and all three have been on this show over the years. So I'm thrilled to talk to Johnny again today. So that's coming up in the interview section. In publishing and book marketing news. So the self-publishing advice blog from the Alliance of Independent Authors has a great article on what sells books in 2022, focusing on Kobo writing life. It includes an analysis of what different groups of readers and listeners want and tips for what works from, from authors making money on Kobo. Some of the tips include opt in to Kobo Plus, the non-exclusive subscription program, and reach readers who are willing to take a chance on a new author since everything is included as part of their subscription, as well as voracious readers who love a series. Also use BookBub ads and the Kobo promotions tab to put your book in front of Kobo readers specifically and encourage readers to borrow through the library since Kobo books are distributed to libraries through Overdrive. Plus, fiction box sets are great for promo deals. Definitely how, um, in terms of my products, fiction box sets make the most income on Kobo for me. And also target wide authors with ads. Uh, If you use BookBub and or Facebook, there's no point in targeting a popular a KU author with um, your Kobo books. Also read the Kobo Writing Life blog or listen to the podcast to get more tips. And remember to ask the helpful staff if you need help. More tips on self-publishing advice as ever links in the show notes. Dave Chesson at Kindlepreneur has an article on how to survive book marketing burnout, which I wanted to bring up this week once more. There's been a lot of episodes in various podcasts on burnout. It's interesting. And a lot of that's to do with pandemic. It's to do with um, anxiety. And let's face it, with the uh, Russia and Ukraine situation and, and frankly, everything else going on in the world book marketing seems like the least important thing. (laughs) And if you have book marketing burnout, you probably have burnout in other areas of your life. And I was thinking about this and this sort of feeling of being battered by the storms of life. We've had a lot of storms here in the UK recently. And sometimes we just have to let some things go. And book marketing, in my opinion, should probably be the first thing out the door. (laughs) If you're finding it hard to cope in general, then like seriously, the last thing you need is trying to figure out your book marketing. Um, But I think this article is really good because it talks about the various symptoms of burnout, fatigue, constant headaches, upset stomach, difficulty sleeping. And I would add a sense of dread and as you approach something. And that uh, rather than an excited desire to learn and try things and sort of the persistent negativity of, oh, I hate marketing. I don't want to do marketing. I don't want to do that. Well, in that case, you need to find something else that you are excited about. Or it may be that the situation is more of a burnout, in which case just let it all go and come back to it later. Now, (laughs) I still I definitely uh, have 
I've been getting better sleep. <laughs> I reported in December that I had a lot of bad sleep last year for various reasons. But doom scrolling doesn't help. And uh, of course, with what's going on right now, it's it's kind of come back. <laughs> I'm trying to stop that. But um, I had a. I went to London last week. I think I, I talked about it on last week's show. But I really couldn't sleep after going to London for the day, and it was because my brain was racing with positive, excited energy to write down some of the things I was thinking and to come up with, you know, I had loads of ideas and I, I had that energised inability to sleep, which is completely different to the sort of negative, terrible thoughts, sense of dread, uh, insomnia type of lack of sleep. And it's still technically lack of sleep, but there's a, a, a difference in the energy. And this is where you need to know yourself and to tap into how you're really feeling with um, book coming back to book marketing. <laughs> Because, I mean, yeah, there are times when if you're excited to learn and you want to get into it, then that's the feeling to follow. And if you're just dreading it and you you just don't want to, then yeah, maybe take a rest and come back to it later. You can't do everything and you have to decide where to focus. Hence why I podcast like this instead of doing videos. In general, I might actually do be doing a video this week. <laughs> but uh, and why I still love, I say I love Twitter. I, I, I love Twitter less than I used to. But in terms of social media, Twitter is still my number one um, uh, pla- platform. And why I will not go anywhere near TikTok, for example. I just don't have the bandwidth. And to protect myself, I have to be clear on what I'm going to do and what I won't do. So back to the article... Dave Chesson's article, really recommend you go and have a look at it and kind of keep it for if you start to feel these things. But the article has some ways to deal with these feelings. And step one just says, stop, (laughs) stop, seriously, stop whatever it is that is causing you such stress and difficulty. Step away, (laughs) step away from the book marketing, step away from the newsfeed and assess what you're doing against your goals, whether it really needs to be done. Eliminate, automate or outsource if you can and refocus on what is sustainable for you. And I talk about a lot of these things in your author business plan and also productivity for authors, which might help if you're struggling with this because uh, and I always have issues with this. I always find myself doing too much and then I'm like, right, what do I need to cut out? So yeah, I hope that helps you. In useful stuff, this week I'm speaking virtually, or I've already recorded it, but uh, the Virtual Introvert Writers Summit that you can find at introvertwriterssummit.com, which runs March 1st to 9th, 2022. If you are an introvert and a writer, as I am, (laughs) you might find it useful. So that's a free online summit. I'm also excited to announce I'll be speaking in person. Yes, real life, physical me, not an avatar. (laughs) At the next SPS Live self-publishing show live with Mark Dawson, James Blatch and a whole load of other awesome indie authors and perhaps you too. And uh, that will be in London, 28th to 29th of June 2022. So summer in London and that will be lovely. I spoke at the inaugural one. There's only been one. Uh, that was in 2020 and it was March 2020 and it was like the last day. In fact, that morning we were all saying, oh, should, should, is this going to go ahead? And uh, the it, the sort of the pandemic was, was approaching and uh, we did that day and I'm glad we did. And then that day I left London and didn't come back for many months. Uh, so it will be brilliant to get back and uh, speaking again in London. So you can go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash SPS live to uh, links in the show notes if you want to come to London in June and uh, meet up in person with lots of indies. And then in other things, if you use Chirp for audiobooks, my Map of Shadows and my other Map Walker books are on special. Map of Shadows is on 99 cent special on Chirp. Um, so are the other books, plus three of my arcane thrillers, all on special on a limited time on Chirp Books. So you can go check them out. And I also wanted to recommend two books this week uh, if you're interested in health and well-being as well as the futurist stuff. So that is Life Force by Tony Robbins and Peter Diamandis and also The Genesis Machine by Amy Webb. Now both I'm reading reading and listening. In fact Life Force I <laughs> Life Force I bought in three formats, ebook, pay, 
hardback and audiobook and the Genesis Mach- Genesis machine uh, I've bought in audiobook and hardback and because these are books that I need to keep my eyes fixed on the horizon so often we find ourselves bogged down in the right now which of course is where we live <laughs> And it is difficult to tear our eyes away from what's going on in the world. But there are so many people working on amazing things. While some some situations are terrible, others are super positive about the future and people working on trying to solve the big problems of our time and learning about the amazing things that's happened that are happening can give you cause to hope rather than despair. And I think we all need that. So that is Life Force by Tony Robbins and Peter Diamandis and The Genesis Machine by Amy Webb. So just a quick personal update because I have sent Crypt of Bone to Kristen, my editor. And of course, the last show, the last in between episode, episode 606 was all about the process. So hopefully you found that useful. Uh, I just have Ark of Blood to go and I'm going to finish that by the end of March. So in Q2 from April, I'll be back on new books. Woohoo! <laughs> I also did a bookbinding session this week, a one-on-one with a very experienced bookbinder who also does restoration and other artistic work with books. And it was brilliant. It was totally physical, nothing digital. Although what is really cool is one of the first questions I had was, can we use my existing print-on-demand? books and rebind those in interesting ways and indeed we can so the project I'm working on I I actually I've um, I'm doing a thousand fiendish angels my short uh, three short stories <laughs> linked by a book of human skin <laughs> because because it's uh, I, I love that trilogy it, it means a lot to me and uh, it's also got a lot of cool imagery in so we're going to do some interesting things with that but what we did the first thing I did was uh, do a new edition which will not be available I made a, t- a little one like the smallest print on demand book that I could do um, but I'm not putting it live as a print on demand I'm just using those books to essentially take the covers off so we stripped the cover off and now we're essentially rebuilding the book but the print on demand edition can be used now this is really good news because I was worried I would have to do a special print run of the books in you know whichever book I wanted to rebind to uh, make some nice art with but essentially I want more art in my life and I've talked about I want more physical more physical more digital that's my sort of new mantra and uh for a bibliophile that includes more beautiful physical books and I I just it feel it just felt almost timeless to be in this um, workshop surrounded by interesting bindings and little bits of art and making (laughs) cool stuff so I will talk more about that and include pictures and when I have something more to show for my time but I'm I'm mainly just learning learning and I I mean it's a hobby it's going to be a hobby but I do hope to at some point put out some limited editions for people to buy and I'm kind of doing that uh, alongside doing digital special editions for people to buy which I will come back to very soon. Right, so thanks for your emails and tweets and comments this week. Craig Martell's interview was very popular, as I expected it to be. Mal York says, For my fellow indies feeling discouraged, I want to recommend the latest episode of the Creative Pen podcast with Craig Martell. It's so encouraging, acknowledges all skill levels, welcomes introverts, and both speakers are easygoing. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mal. And Joy Sky says, listening to the podcast with the remarkable Craig Martel from my lovely garden in Corfu. Scenes of the Albanian coastline absolutely free. And sent a lovely picture. And uh, I definitely, Corfu was on our list last year and then I had COVID. Um, but hopefully we'll get over there this year. Uh, also, thanks to Lorraine, who sent a couple of photos of a cemetery in the West Australian goldfields, which has inspired a ghost story or two. Thank you to everyone who sends me pictures of cemeteries, ossuaries, graveyards. You know I love them. <laughs> Thank you, fellow taffophiles. And uh, just a couple of people who already commented on the last in between. episode. Bob Keed said... 
This episode has lots of practical details on how the Creative Pen's craft has evolved and why it made sense for her to revisit these earlier works. Thanks for sharing, Bob. And Stephen Ramirez commented, fantastic and timely. I'm currently rewriting my zombie trilogy for the 10-year anniversary. Like yours, the books were already good, but there are things I can do to really make them pop. And that is exactly the point, which is really make them pop. We're not saying that the the early books are bad in any way. Uh, It's that we can, we know now what to do to make them even better, which is cool. I mean, let's face it, learning things is cool. So you can tweet me at the creative pen and send me pictures of where you're listening. I always love to see your pictures uh, or email me joanna at the creative pen dot com or leave a comment on the show notes or the YouTube channel. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. So today's show is sponsored by Ingram Spark. I use Ingram Spark to print and distribute my self-published print books wide because with Ingram Spark, it's my content, but they help me do more with it. And in fact, I have been uploading the new editions of Stone of Fire onto Ingram Spark this week. So why even consider Ingram Spark? Well, if you only use KDP Print, then bookstores, libraries, universities, and print on demand sites in many countries will not even consider your book because you need to offer a discount and also you'll be in their catalogues. Plus, a lot of these places will never consider ordering from Amazon for obvious reasons. (laughs) So if you care about getting your books into these places, you need to go wide with print. And remember, this is not about Kindle Unlimited, which is for ebooks. Even if you are exclusive with your ebooks, you can still go wide with print with Ingram Spark. You will have access to over 40,000 retailers, independent bookstores, libraries, schools, universities, chain bookstores, and more across a global network of distributors, including bookstores like Foils, Blackwells and Waterstones in the UK, as well as Bookshop.org, which has become very popular in the pandemic, Booktopia in Australia and New Zealand, Chapters Indigo in Canada, Walmart, Target and loads of independent bookstores in the USA. Of course, it does mean your book will be available to order, but you will still have to drive demand. But since having my books on Ingram Spark, I have had many pictures of my print books in libraries and also had them sold at bookstores, conventions and in physical stores. And uh, I even walked into a Blackwell's in Edinburgh one day. I was visiting my brother and we stumbled upon one of my books in Blackwell's and it was it was like a serious shock, but amazing. And they just ordered it through Ingram Spark. You can choose to use returns, but it's not necessary. You can also choose your discount percentage. You can also bulk order, for example, if you want back of the room copies for live events. And I've shipped those, uh, you know, because they have printers in different countries, you can order them in the country where you're speaking. So I had one in Australia, for example, a few years ago, (laughs) pre-pandemic. Or if you work direct with schools or bookstores, uh, you can order them direct. So I've ordered uh, boxes of books to go, you know, to a bookstore store in the USA, for example, and I order them on Ingram, ship them and then invoice. It all works very well. And also just a reminder that paper prices continue to rise and supply chains are difficult. This is nothing to do with Ingram Spark. This is to do with the whole of the supply chain for paper. This is affecting traditional publishers uh, and everyone else, basically. So if you have published on Ingram Spark, then it's probably time to check your print prices are still making you decent money. It might be time to raise your prices. Uh, and that's probably true across the board. So what are you waiting for? It's your content. Do more with it. Head on over to ingramspark.com. Right, so this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating the show is as ever sponsored by my wonderful patrons and uh, especially the in-between episodes I do all supported by patrons. Thanks to everyone who's been supporting the show for years and months. Uh, You guys are all amazing. And uh, I always appreciate returning patrons and also those of you who uh, put your uh, support up. I appreciate you guys too. Welcome to new patrons, Lorraine. Lorraine Horsley, Melanie and Trisha Gardella. I really appreciate your support on Patreon. It demonstrates you enjoy the show and want it to continue. You can support the show with just a couple of dollars or euros or pounds or Canadian dollars uh, a month and you'll get the extra monthly Q&A audio and you'll get extra 
uh, money off my ebooks, audiobooks, and courses. You can support the show at patreon.com, P A T R E O N.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Johnny B. Truant is the author and co author of over 100 books across multiple genres and the co founder of Sterling and Stone, a multimedia story studio, along with Sean Platt and David Wright. One of Johnny's books, Fat Vampire, sold to NBC Universal for production in 2021 as a sci fi original. And some of you might even remember when he came up the idea live on the Better Off Undead podcast years ago. So, welcome back to the show, Johnny. Hey, Joanna. It's so great to uh, to be back here. You and I go back just about as long as I've been doing internet stuff. So that's Hi, cool. we, we do. We do. And we're going to come to that in a minute um, because I was your fan way before you were um, a, a fiction writer. But um, I want to take us all the way back. We're focusing on creative pivots. So you started uh, when I first heard about your journey, you talked about doing a PhD. I think it was in genetics. So talk about that. Why did you stop doing that PhD? And how has that knowledge still ended up in your fiction. Yeah, this is actually really appropriate timing. So first of all, I've recently re- revisited one of our smaller books, uh, nonfiction books called The Story Solution, which is like how life is like a story. And so I revisited a lot of this. And then also I did my daughter's career day where I talked about, um, they asked for like educational requirements for your job. And I was like, well, none, but I have these credentials and guess what? They filter into my work. So very appropriate. Basically. I wanted to, I was always a good student and I sort of created that as my identity. Like I was valedictorian of my high school class and and I got a lot of validation from just kind of being good scholastically. And so it was natural for me when I went to college to aim high and high by my definition was the quote unquote most prestigious degree. So this was basically an ego move if you're getting this. Plus I did like science a whole lot. And so it just seemed logical to me in the absence of any other viable considerations, including writing, because who in, you know, the early aughts was able to make a living as a writer like that was (laughs) absurd at the time. So a nice, respectable job to me meant, I don't know, following my trajectory and and getting a a PhD in it was genetics as molecular genetics. And uh, it was about, I would say, six months into it before I started to realize oh, this is a really, really bad fit for me. I wasn't like the people who were doing the work. I didn't enjoy the work itself. I didn't enjoy the environment. The schedule did not fit with my all my other interests. I didn't have time for other things because it was a lot of time and it was far away. And I, I realized that I had t- made a misstep when I made the calculation of how many fruit flies I had looked at under a microscope. So we used to like do these cultures of these stinking yeast smelling cultures of fruit flies. And there was a gene that would express with red eye color. And so I would know that they took up the gene if they had the red eye color. And so we used to knock them out with gas and use a little paintbrush to move them across the stage of a compound microscope and look for flies with red eyes, which sounds like the most absurd thing for anyone ever to do. And I figured I had looked at a half a million fruit flies And then I said, okay, this is not what I want to do with my life. And I kind of jumped ship without a net at that point and moved into the next phase, which was uh, sort of where we ran into each other. Mm, But you still put genetics in your fiction, don't you? I, I do. And this is what I told the kids when I did career day is that for a writer, and I know that you know this because you talk about it all the time and you're always traveling and stuff is everything that comes into you. I like to imagine like a big old funnel on the head of a creator and it just, everything comes in and everything becomes story fodder. And so I'm completing our series, The Beam right now. There's a large component of science that's in it, including genetics. And my other degree was in philosophy and it's very heavy on philosophy. So I didn't use anything directly and I have no formal writing training, so I'm not even using that directly, but it, it's all there. And I think that it speaks to my unique voice as a creator. You know, I'm not a lot of people do exactly the same melding that I do. It's like my individual writer's fingerprint. So I'm real pleased with that. 
Yeah, me too. And I love the beam. And also I'm the same. I have degrees in theology and psychology and neither of which I ever used professionally, but I use them in my writing. So I, that's a good message of people yeah. listening. Like nothing is wasted. It all goes in the story. But yes, I came across you in around 2009 when you were working as a copywriter, freelance, obviously, and also at Copy Blogger, which I used to read. And I bought one of your courses, Question the Rules. Uh, <laughs> and I actually went on the Wayback Machine to find the original website. And the tagline was the non-conformists punk rock DIY nuts and bolts guide to creating the business and life you really want, which is hilarious because you just talked about basically being a geek and a good student and I'm a good girl. And I'm like, oh yeah, I reckon I could be punk rock like Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> so um, tell us about that phase and, and why copywriting and, and what did you learn then that you still find useful today? As far as the the punk rock thing, it actually is kind of funny because I'm only realizing as I'm saying this, that I think that there are several major groups of people who know me and the people who would think Johnny's more like punk rock nonconformist would never believe that I was this studious academic. And the people that knew me as the studious academic, I mean, I was a nerd, right? I was not cool. I was not climbing the social ladder in high school. Like I was socially not anywhere near the top. And so the idea of me being like kind of a punk rock guy is probably ludicrous to them. But I think that I've always resisted uh, that assumption that just because something is being done the way that it is being done, that is the correct way to do it. Do you know the, the parable about the, the ham in the oven with cutting off the end of the ham? Do you know that one? Uh, you better tell it. I, I don't recall. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is one that that I really like, and it's become lexicon in the company where we we refer to the story all the time. The story goes something like this, and this is just allegorical, is um, family sitting around for a big dinner, like Thanksgiving dinner, or to be more universal, Christmas, because not everybody does American Thanksgiving, and they're preparing a ham, and the mom slices off the end of the ham, and and the kid is like, well, why do you do that? Why do you slice off the end of the ham? And she says, well, I don't know. It's the way that my mom always did it. And so they go to the, the mother who is also there and, hey, mom, why do you slice off the end of the ham? She goes, well, that's the way that grandma always did it. And then they go to grandma who's there too. And why did grandma do it? And she goes, oh, well, I used to have a really little oven. <laughs> and so the joke is that you keep doing things the way that they've always been done. And you've completely lost track of the reason that they're even being done. And so I think that a lot of the things that I've looked at, I tend to kind of have that opinion of like, if this is the way that things are normally done, is it the best way to do things? Or are we carrying over hangover from previous generations of believing that things are done correctly? And so I think that the punk rock thing, I mean, I was very interested in punk rock for a while. I do like punk rock, but it's really more about that. Just kind of questioning, questioning authority, questioning the way that things are normally done and saying, does that make sense to keep doing it? Yes. And the course was called Question the Rules. And I was definitely um, attracted to that, even though I'm, I call myself a bit of a vanilla goth. Uh, I'm not <laughs> goth on the outside, I'm goth on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was attracted to that. But I also, I do generally obey the rules. But of course, 2009 was the early days of self-publishing. And I I started this podcast in 2009, which is kind of crazy. But yeah, going back to the copywriting, so you were, you had a main, most of your career at that point was copywriting. So what did you learn from copywriting and course creation that you still use today? I think that my driving instinct has always been, how do I get to do the most of what I want to do and have the most freedom of time and still survive? So when you look at my journey through that lens, I think it makes a lot more sense because it went from, because there's some steps missing here. So, so I went, once I realized that my academic career was not going to happen, I was not going to be a professional scientist. I said, well, what can I do? There's got to be something I can do where I don't have to go get a job. I don't want to go get a job. Then I'm I'm tied down. So my mom worked in, she had a, a marketing communications firm and I got a few jobs with her just doing like sell sheets for products for like 35 bucks or something like that each. And um, was working at like a Starbucks at the time to just make ends meet. And then through writing, I figured out, I always knew I was pretty good at writing and I started to get some magazine freelance jobs. I wrote a ton of human resource 
magazine articles and magazines for graphic design communication. So I wrote a lot of that and I did a lot of marketing copy as well. And so only after that did I decide that I was going to try my hand at online writing. And so I did the usual searches, make money online, make (laughs) money blogging. And of course, those things send you to back in, um, back in the early tens, back in like 2000 to 2000, I'm sorry, 2010 to 2012, they took you to two primary sites. What were those sites, Joanna? Copy blogger and pro blogger. Yes, those are exactly (laughs) the sites. And so I kind of kicked around and, and got to know those people. And it just seemed natural to get into to, to blogging just because that was a way that I could potentially make my own fortune rather than relying on somebody who was asking me to punch a clock. I just started with a humor blog and tried to monetize it with like AdSense ads. And you're lucky if you make a few bucks with an AdSense ad in a, a month. And mm-hmm. from there, just, just knowing that community, knowing pro blogger and copy blogger, Then I saw what people were doing with creating courses and sharing whatever knowledge they did have. And I got into a little bit of that and wrote a lot for Copyblogger because they were kind of like the primo institution to to get ideas out there. And I think that's when uh, we ran into each other. Yeah, absolutely. And I still think the copywriting skills, headlines and all of that, that still plays a part in email. I know you guys don't blog much anymore, but it it, it does help, doesn't it, with writing sales descriptions and, and all of that kind of thing. All those skills are still useful. Yeah, emails. And I also think in fiction. Uh, I mean, the, the concept of burying the lead is not something that's unique to copywriting. So for anybody who doesn't know that concept, basically the lead is the least you need to know to keep you interested in reading usually an article. Um, But if you're talking about fiction and if you don't grab the attention of somebody, or if you're further into a book and a chapter doesn't announce its intentions or set the scene or do something that intrigues the reader, which is the equivalent of the lead, then you lose them there too. So I think that those copywriting skills apply to just about any attempt that somebody's making to get attention. Yeah. And I still think authors should probably do some sort of copywriting 101, which copy blogger still has. So mm-hmm. <laughs> people can go get that. Okay. So let's come on to writing. So your first novel, Bialy Pimps, <laughs> yes. uh, took you a long time to write. And of course, uh, when I heard this, um, being British, I was like, I don't know what this is. Is this some kind of dance? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows what it is. Exactly. So why did it take you so long to write this? And how did you move past all the problems of that first book? Well, I basically, the the answer to that question starts with why I wrote it in the first place. So I always wanted to be a writer, uh, a novelist, but I knew at the time how difficult that was. So for anybody who's new to writing, you don't know maybe that what you used to do was you'd write a complete book. And then you'd send off query letters to agents, just a one page letter explaining who you were and what accolades you had and try to interest them in your book. And if you were lucky, they'd ask you to send three chapters. And then if you're really lucky, they'd ask for the whole book. And there was like this long imperiled route to getting like a really substandard royalty and back at the shelf treatment, right? Like it kind of was a bad deal. So, so I didn't get into when I didn't write that book in the same mentality that I wrote my current books. Like it's my job now, just to be clear, I don't have another outside job. Like I write books for a living, but that book I wrote, um, I I have the story I've told a few times where when I was in grad school, I started having panic attacks and it took that to get me out because I'm a very stubborn person in that way. Like I like to finish things that I start. And so I wouldn't have left if it hadn't gotten really bad. And so as it started to get really bad, or I think actually slightly before it started to get bad, I was really missing my college days. I loved college and I did not like grad school and they were cities apart. One was in Columbus, one was in Cleveland. And so looking back that I needed to return to those better times. And so the Bialy Pimps is a semi, it's fictional, but a lot of it is true because I really did work in, it's about a bagel deli. It's about a bunch of like malcontents who work in a bagel deli in, at a college campus. And that's exactly what I did in college. And so I needed to go back there in my head to basically have some semblance of sanity. And so I was writing this book and it was entirely autobiographical at the beginning. 
I even used the real people's real names. There was nothing <laughs> fictional at the beginning. I exaggerated things. Like we had these crazy zany characters and I made them more zany, but mostly it was like, I might as well have been writing in a journal. And it was to the, like, it was so extreme that I was halfway through the book before I realized I didn't actually have a story. I was just telling the tales of what happened and they were amusing to me. It was like Canterbury tales for the modern age. And so once I started to develop it into a book, that was a process of learning like, okay, well, so where is this going to go? And I didn't really have an antagonist and I needed to add an antagonist. And so I figured out how to write that book as a matter of like, I had to get it out. I psychologically had to get out of my current world and spend more time in the old world that I loved so much. So part of the reason that it took less, more time than my other books is because I frankly needed it to. And when it was done, it was a mess because not only did it not really start as a story, it started, it was uh, self-indulgent. Like it was just, it was me telling me my story. It was me suggesting a way that maybe I could do it better. Looking back, it's really funny if I were to mm. read that first version, because like, why did I not understand this right away? Like I was clearly spelling it out. And so the, the way that that book was written was just a different animal than the way and the purpose that I write today. And then a lot of um, what I did was revise, 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 revise. So I think that there's a long time between when I started that book and when I published it. So it was probably 10 to 15 years. I don't remember the number I give between when I wrote it and when I published it, but I wasn't working on it that whole time. That said, it did take a lot more time. Now going forward, Fat Vampire, which was my next book, I wrote in maybe a month. But again, I had a cheat because I knew uh, the markers were already set out for me. Because uh, yes, I was telling the story of an underdog story in the vampire world and a non-conventional vampire story, but it was still a vampire story. So the touchstones are all there. There's somebody who gets bitten by a vampire. They don't believe it for a while. They try their powers. They discover things they have to feed. Like the landmarks of the vampire story are similar to every other vampire story. So it was simple for me to write that. And it was only when I wrote my third book, which I think, <laughs> no, no, I wrote two or three fat vampires books, but the next franchise I think was Unicorn Western, which I wrote with Sean. And that was when I needed story help. And fortunately, I had it. Like, I'm good at articulating a story. I'm good at working with somebody to figure something out and then working my way through a plot. But nakedly going after a plot is very hard for me. So in one way, I did solve those problems and I do write a lot faster. But in another way, I had to get a partner to do it. And it would have been much harder if I didn't have the cheat of, number one, a real story or a well-told story like the vampire legend. Mm, I love that. And some people talk about uh, some first books are almost like clearing your throat. And it seems like the Bialy yeah. Pimps was you getting rid of all that stuff. And you almost had to write that to get it behind you. And then you, things took off. But um, I like the idea of touchstones of genre because... Mm -hmm. You know, we we can, and also as readers, that, that that's what we love. We love those. We want to see those things. But you mentioned Sean Platt there, and David Wright obviously is is also in Sterling and Stone. And I've had all three of you separately <laughs> on the show, and I was on your show years ago. And how did that those relationships start? And I mean, you mentioned that you figured out you needed this kind of co writing experience. Mm. But how how did that come about? So. Basically, I actually think this is kind of an interesting tale because Sean and I met at Blog World. So that's very much a copy blogger world sort of an event. And we, I mean, you've met Sean, you know, anybody who's met Sean knows that he he's full of ideas and he's very enthusiastic and he has a way of making everybody else enthusiastic. And so he and I started talking and we bonded over, of all things, Andre Chaperone's course, Auto Autoresponder Madness. We were like Autoresponder Madness fanboys. <laughs> and when I was done and I was kind of high on having met some more internet people and shared space with them and all that, um, around the same time, I listened to Pat Flynn talk in an he does Smart Passive Income. I actually don't know if he still does. But yeah, yeah, he, he does. He does. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think Pat's great. But he talked about how his podcast, and look who I'm talking to, right? That his podcast was like this great vehicle for him. 
And so I pitched Sean the idea of writing a podcast, I'm doing a podcast, largely because I knew that Sean and Dave were already writing like machines and they were doing it in a marketing minded way. They were writing in episodes and serials because they could bundle things and they could do all these marketing tricks with fiction. And they were self-publishing, which is something I hadn't approached yet, self-publishing digitally through Amazon, through Kindle. And I was very hungry for that. And so I figured that if we got on a podcast, I could learn from them. I didn't think we'd work together necessarily, but I could learn from them. And once we started going, then then Dave made this infamous now joke about how Sean wanted to write a Western and Dave, who was his writing partner, said, that's ridiculous. Uh, I'm not going to do all the research to write a Western. And even though I really like doing research, looking back, it's funny. We made fun of Dave for, well, you don't need to do research to write a <laughs> Western. You could just put the guy on a unicorn and then you don't have to do research because it's clearly not really on earth. And Sean said, I think we should write Unicorn Western. And so that was the beginning of Sean and I writing together, which you know, I've written pretty much everything since with Sean. But then we wanted to form, Sean wanted to form a company because another thing that Sean does is what's next. So it's not just what you're doing right now, it's how do we make it bigger and better. And for Sean, that meant making a company. And fast forward to today, we have, I think, a dozen people working with us and we're a little story studio that's out there pitching to Hollywood. But I actually didn't want to form a company. I kind of like came along because there was this enthusiasm and I liked writing with Sean. I liked working with Sean. And we did form this company with the three of us originally, me, Sean, and Dave. But Dave was dragged kicking and screaming. Dave is not a business-minded person and doesn't want to be. And so very quickly, it turned into Sean and I running the company and Dave being a writer. Mm. And just recently, I would say, well, recently, it's been about two years, I did the same thing. So now Sean and um, his partner, Neve, run the company, and Dave and I are sort of like flagship authors. But that's been that evolution because for the longest time, we were doing both. You know, we were putting on the Smarter Artist Summit, we were running the Stone Table Mastermind, we were creating Story Shop software. Like we were doing all these other things because we were co running a business. And now I'm just writer creator, and Sterling and Stone as a company is just we create stories, we tell stories, and nothing else. Mm. I actually think this is really important because you were good at the business as far as I could see. You were good Thank at marketing. You. you were good at speaking. You were good at all this stuff. You're good at podcasting. I mean, mm. you, and this is what's interesting. You made a decision to cut things back that you were good slash successful at in order to focus on the thing that you really wanted to do. And uh, I mean, I certainly struggle with this all the time. What can I cut back? Not bad things, good things. What good things do I have to cut back in order to focus on creative work? And I know a lot of the listeners struggle with this too. It's easy to give up stuff that's not working, but in <laughs> terms of the things that actually we were enjoying in some way or were bringing in money in some way. So how did you get to that point of going, I really have to cut back. I have to step away from that. I want to focus on what I really love. Uh, Sean and I were as good a partners as we were going to be meaning that I don't in any way think that we were really bad partners, but I would say that we were ill-fit partners for what we were trying to create. I wanted to go deep and Sean wanted to go broad. So I wanted to tell more and more and deeper and deeper stories. I wanted to keep my hands in the story and keep doing more and more of that. Sean wanted to do the stories and everything ancillary to the, ancillary to the stories. He wanted to create a studio. And, and I'm really glad he did. Because I've been extraordinarily fortunate that I've been able to benefit from everything Sean wanted to do without having to yoke myself with it anymore. So the simple reason, one of the reasons that we stopped doing it is because it was just really painful after a while. Like we, we had a lot of well-behaved disagreements, I would say. I'm not a person who enjoys or is good with conflict. I just don't like it. And so that really bugged me. And it was just like a lot of agita for a long time that it was a little like the panic attacks when I was in college, because I just knew it was wrong. And I just, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to fight anymore. I don't want to worry about the business's money anymore. I don't want to do this. And so it, it made sense to both of us. It was a truly mutual divorce of that part of our relationship. 
because it was just so clear to both of us that I shouldn't be doing that version and that I always should have just stayed in story. What's interesting with collaboration is that the whole point of collaboration is finding what you're good at, what the other person or people are good at, and then together creating something more than you can do alone, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the hard thing, I think. It's interesting to talk to people who collaborate in the way that you guys do, because I know, for example, I'm such a control freak when it comes to story and business. <laughs> so <laughs> I think I, I at some point decided, right, I'm not growing my company because this is, I'm a one person business. That's what I like. I have freelancers and things, but I don't um, do that. But I, yeah, having watched you, it's so interesting. But coming back to the events, um, you had the self-publishing podcast for years. You guys, yeah, we had events, including the one in Austin, Texas in 2016, which I spoke at as well. So you still have, you guys still have nonfiction books up and also you're well known in, in the author community. So how does that still play a part in your life? Uh, it really doesn't, actually. Mm -hmm. We do still have our, our nonfiction books out there. So the best known of them is Write, Publish, Repeat. And I always say it with that cadence because you usually just say Write, Publish, Repeat. And people are like, who's Write, Publish, Repeat? <laughs> um, but Write, Publish, Repeat was our big one. Um, that was sort of a self-publishing writing instructional manual that's probably a little bit out of date now because the self-publishing landscape has changed a little bit. We had some follow-ups to that. We had a series that was basically writing instruction that hasn't even, some of that hasn't even come out yet. Bonnie wrote a lot of those. She's our story expert and the story solution, which I mentioned. They're still out there, but we don't really actively push them anymore. We used to have the self-publishing podcast and that was our major vehicle. We now have a podcast. I think the Story Studio podcast is still running. That was an in-between for us. But we stopped that recording that years ago, and we're recording one now that hasn't seen the light of day yet, but that will shortly. And it, it is largely story analysis, largely um, movies and TV, where we talk about things that we like from a story perspective. But as far as the, I would say the nonfiction, the writers as customers instruction, uh, I enjoy doing that sort of thing if it comes up, but usually in a broadcast way. Like I like to, this is, I like to. I like to preach, not teach, right? I like to be up on stage and I just, there's something about that that I like. I don't necessarily like really working one-on-one, -on -one. but I, I don't know. I mean, opportunities may come up. I know that you do some speaking. I think that I would be interested in speaking, but that's just because that's something I enjoy. I enjoy speaking. So we, mm. we really don't do any nonfiction at all anymore. Like we're totally focused on getting our stories sold. Mm. But do you think that played a part in almost bridging a period when you guys didn't have a massive backlist in that it did provide income for what was at the time a, a kind of fledgling company and yeah. it sort of provided that buffer at a time when you were leaders in the indie community around around doing this stuff. But then I guess now it's backlist. And it's funny you say you're not doing anything because I see the books in my also boughts all the time. And also I think in my ads on my books. <laughs> so someone in Sterling and Stone is putting those, like still keeping that alive in some sense. Um. I'm actually curious about that. I'm wondering if we're getting also bots because they're just tied in the algorithm. To answer your larger question, yes, we absolutely enjoyed and needed those years. I think that um, I as an individual and Sterling and Stone as a company are both extremely scrappy. And so we always tended to do what was necessary in the moment in the best way that we could and what felt right in the moment and what we were called to do in the moment. So at the time when we were doing writing instruction, that was something that we were really passionate about. I mean, I loved putting on the Smarter Artist Summit. No, no, no. I enjoyed being at the Smarter <laughs> Artist Summit. I hated putting it on. It was terrible putting it on. We always lost money on it, that sort of thing. But it was the right thing at the right time. And everything, so many good things came out of it. Like, just to be a little squishy, like I'm one of those people, I do believe everything tends to happen for a reason. The right things tend to happen at the right time. The teacher tends to show up when the student is ready. And so everything that came out of that, like all of the people who work with us came because we met them at an event. We wouldn't have our studio of writers. 
Um, some of the cachet that we do have now comes from the fact that we have authority in the space, either as podcasters or as writing instructors. We wouldn't know you if I didn't do any teaching. If I was just out there writing books, I wouldn't know you. We wouldn't know a lot of people. So it was definitely wonderful at the time, perfect at the time. It was a relatively straightforward way to make money. Not easy, but straightforward, whereas selling fiction is not usually straightforward. And so, yeah, it was kind of like we got to a point where we said, this isn't, and we actually did an analysis. We actually said, what does each side of the business bring in financially and what do uh, we pay into it? And you'd think, because all of our money at at the time that we made this decision was coming from the nonfiction side. Um, It was coming from our mastermind. It was coming from our events. But then when we turned around and we looked and we said, what are we putting into this? It was no contest. It was definitely losing us money, especially when you factored in soft costs like our time and our Mm -hmm. attention and our distraction. And so when we realized how much, because we had a huge payroll at one point, we had all sorts of people working for us to help run this big machine. And we sort of said, what if we just let it go? And that's what we did. And somehow we've managed to survive. It has not been easy. We've always had to do something to make ends meet. Yeah, I, I find this so interesting. I'm loving this discussion. And so and, and I, I think one of the, just even to bring it up right now, so often we think we need to plan everything, right? We want to plan our lives. I mean, I do goals and I love all that stuff. And yet everything you've said so far, you might have had a broad intention to become a writer, but all of these pivots were, like you said, the right thing at the right time. Did you plan any of this? <laughs> no. Um no, we, I don't think I've ever really planned anything. I've always had a big picture. That it's funny that you asked me that. This, that's a really interesting question because I've always kind of had a, a compass. This may be the best way to put it. Like I've always had a, a driving intention. And given enough time, it will steer me to where I want to go. But, but the ups and downs along the way are always surprising. They're not always good. Like I had some serious financial failures predating even anything that, that you even know about um, just because I'm, you know what? Okay. So part of it, this is actually the missing answer that I didn't give earlier. Cause you were asking about how do you, how do you drop out of things and stuff? And the answer is that I'm stubborn. And so um, kind of obnoxiously stubborn about this is what I want to do. And this is what I don't want to do. And this is how much I want to work. And this is how much I don't want to work. And I mean, when I have partners, there's a certain amount of bending and, and accommodating and just being cool that needs to happen. But I, I, always in the back of my mind is that compass. Like, well, okay, so we're going to do this for a while, but really we want to be over here. So kind of keep that, that peripheral eye out for opportunities to move in this direction. But I, I just, I, I don't like to do things I don't like to do. So the second I kind of see a better way to do them, I'll usually do them. And I've been super, super fortunate that I've been with mainly Sean, who has handled a lot of that stuff that I don't want to do. So I'm in a position now where I get to kind of have an amazing deal as an author. I only really do what I want to do, but that only works because what I produce is of value to the company and they do the rest. So I guess stubbornness, stubbornness and a refusal to, you know, like I don't work crazy hours either. I don't work on weekends, that sort of thing. I like the idea of the compass that keeps bringing you back yeah. to where you ultimately want to go. And I think that's such an important thing for everyone listening. Like you just don't know. So let's talk about Fat Vampire because you talk, You said earlier that was the second book. It was a joke that you guys came up with. <laughs> and at then, Dave's expense. Yeah, at Dave's expense. And it was, a, it was a joke and you wrote it and then you wrote some more. And now you've got this deal. So tell us about that. How did that come to, to fruition? Uh, you know, it's funny because only now that I'm at the end stages of this, and by end stages, I mean that they're in production right now. I'm actually going out next week to to watch it be filmed for a week, and they're going to be done. They're going to be wrapped in like a month or two. So when I say done, I mean that knock on wood, it looks like this is going all the way. And so only from this perspective have I looked back and said, oh my God, that is really, really unusual. I got so lucky. Or things just worked out so well because it's extraordinarily rare to have something optioned and then purchased and then go all the way to completion, kind of without a hitch. But the whole thing has been that way. So 
on top of you expecting an up and down kind of trip with a lot of trials and tribulations and a lot of failure, um, you know, you might think, well, how many times did I pitch this? How hard did I work out to work to go sell it? And the answer is not at all. I had a pro high profile inquiry years before this one that came to nothing, but it was like, you know, a name that everybody would know and their agent contacted me and was interested and nothing came of it. But again, I didn't do anything to get that. Somebody just emailed me. And then this time it was the same deal. I got an email from somebody who ultimately worked with the BBC of all places, but he knew uh, this team that's working on it now. And and they put the deal together and just, are you cool with that? Do you want to do that? And I brought in a lawyer and they were very, very cool with me to the point of just agreeing to whatever I wanted to do and working with me however they could. And it was so easy. Like I know that that's not what somebody who struggled with this wants to hear, but it just kind of fell in my lap. But to me, that speaks to having a catchy hook and title because the idea of fat vampire makes everybody's antenna go up and just kind of being out there. I published that book, I think in 2012. And I think we had first inquiry. I'm going to guess 2019, maybe no. Yeah, it was probably 20. It might've been 2018, but that's a decent span of time. And all that time, the book was just, I was getting the book bub ads. I was putting it free. I was making it paid. I was doing box sets. And it just got out there enough that eventually the right people saw it. And, and they did see it wide. We've had several out of the blue inquiries, inquiries for fran- our various properties. And they've all come from like Apple books. People never find us on Amazon. It's that always wide. Very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, well, I think this is important. You didn't have an agent. I mean, you didn't have a... a, Still don't. Yeah, still don't. Okay. It didn't hit like number one on Amazon, which is how people Mm -mm. found it. It just somehow, presumably, people were sort of scrolling and look or might have been searching for vampires. And and again, Fat Vampire has a really good hook. So that is a good tip for people. I mean, it's a hook. It's, um, I mean, the cover wasn't even that like awesome at the time like Mm -hmm. your covers have all got amazing now but early days the covers weren't weren't massively great either were you so this was really a a hook but again your second book is just fantastic so um yeah so you said then it's rare for a book to go to get an option let alone to go into production so why is sterling and stone as a story studio now really focusing on film and tv if it's so difficult to get these deals even though it hasn't been for you (laughs) Oh, well, just because it's difficult doesn't mean we're not going to do it. So there's a few things here. So first of all, once you have one success, then it's much, much, much more likely to have more. Um, One of the exercises that I like to do, and and I apologize to everybody out there who's an independent, like single author, because you aren't going to have what I'm about to say, but we do have a collective of people and we do have an extensive back catalog of, frankly, patting myself on the back, pretty good stuff. And so what I like to do is I like to put myself in the shoes of somebody who is um, looking for content. So there's one producer that we've talked to who's a name and he's done a bunch of stuff that, again, people would know. And I don't remember the, the figures here. Sean would be able to give you exact figures. And he has something like 70 projects going right now with Netflix that are live. And when you're producing that much stuff and when there's Netflix and Amazon Prime and Hulu and Apple TV and all these minor streamers and Peacock and Tubi and Pluto and all these, everybody needs content. And so if you're somebody like that guy that I mentioned who has so many projects, wouldn't it be great to find somebody who you, who was easy to work with and who you could keep going back to and you knew that they were cool, you knew they had good stories? So... Sean and Neve have pitched something like 30, 35 different companies, you know, most of whom have been like, oh, that's really cool what you guys are doing. They've liked what we've pitched them. It's just a very long and slow process. But by putting our attention on that, you know, that million dollar customer instead of the $5 customer as primary lets us, you know, get books out into the hands of our readers. But at the same time, we know we're playing this bigger game. And we can get in front of more people through that sort of thing. Mm. And again, yeah, it might take a decade, but um, 
who knows? And also, presumably, you've, you've been, I saw there's quite a few books in the Fat Vampire series now, which presumably when the series goes out, you might sell lots of. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope so. Um, one of the things, I mean, the, the first season of the TV show covers the first book. And the way they were, I was in the writer's room a few times with them. And the way that they were talking, I think the second season, if there is one, will probably follow the second book. So even the TV show will hopefully follow those books if they keep going. But then I have this deep funnel of actual vampire books to sell as well. So yeah, I, I hope so. I hope they take off. Mm, and this is so important. I mean, I think it took like 20 years for Lee Child to get the first Jack Reacher book made mm -hmm. or for someone to option it. Obviously, Tom Cruise optioned it and now it's going to be on Amazon Prime as a series. And these things can take a long time, but uh, you guys are just building IP, right? All the time, you're building more and more books. So, right. so with that, it, it does sort of puzzle me as to how the business model is now. So how, what does the company look like and what's your role? Uh, I'm flagship author is sort of the role, the, the word we've been using. I, I'm a content provider essentially, but I'm flagship content provider mm. and all of the the marketing and the the shaking of hands and making of pitch packages and all that stuff is being done by Sean and Neve who are the two primary partners right now i would say ceo and and uh, coo is is probably the best way to describe their roles and they're just pitch machines and they just go out there and they pitch but but honestly i think that time and exposure are doing half of this job for us so I think this is an interesting thing worth pointing out um, is you never know where your stuff is going to go and you can't know it until it shows up. So you gave the example in a previous podcast of my, you, my essay, which I don't know that I'm allowed to name it. Um, <laughs> you, can, but, you, you can name it without the swear word. Yes. The universe doesn't give a flying bleep about you. Um, you know, I just, I kind of wrote that. That was a blog post. It was in before I was writing fiction and um, a ton of people have, have contacted me and said, you know, Hey, I read this. It was really interesting. And then recently um, Oliver Berkman, who did 4,000 weeks and which, you know, Tim Ferriss played that chapter on his podcast, he reviewed it and he mentioned it again in 4,000 weeks. And so like, how did that get out there? And we were talking to, well, Sean and Eve were talking to a producer pitching something that we had going and they mentioned you know johnny b truant works with us uh and they said the guy said what who johnny b truant yes johnny and the guy turned around they were on a video zoom call turned around and pulled a paperback of fat vampire off his shelf and he goes you mean this guy so like <laughs> i mean that sort of thing like and, and the the fat vampire tv show which is currently has the working title reginald the vampire which oh my god i I so hope that's a working title. And I, I've been told it is because I just don't like that title. But um, that stars Jacob Batalon, who's in the Spider-Man movies. And, and I exchanged a few emails with him and he said, oh, yeah, I read the books years ago. I think they're really great. People on his Instagram comment that they, oh, I loved those books. So you get in this bubble as a writer where it's you don't get feedback all the time. You get feedback that's negative. You get feedback that's like really superlative. But that average like I read your book. I like it. I enjoy you. You don't see it. And so it's easy to forget that your books are out there working for you right now and you're building a fan base you don't even know exists. Wow. This is so great. And I mean, let's, the as a final tip, what would you tell Johnny who was writing The Bialy Pimps? There's a lot of people listening who's still on their first book or second book or third book in the early days and can't even imagine like your career path. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you tell those that early Johnny? Okay, so I'm assuming in this um, example that I don't have foreknowledge of the future. I can't guarantee future Johnny that things are going to no, work out the not. way they have, right? <laughs> okay. So I think what I would say is that it, you need to do this job. You should do this job if if you can't not do it. If you If you are a writer, if you find a way to do the writing and just because you need to do it and because you found some way to do it, right? Like you found some way to subsidize you in the meantime, you found the time before you go to work and you should do it for the love of it rather than with some goal in mind, because yes, with smart marketing, savvy persistence, time, and talent, you will eventually find a fan base. That's almost inevitable by the numbers, but you don't know that it'll ever be a full-time income. You certainly don't know that you'll ever um, have a bestseller or get anything optioned or made for TV or film. 
So you kind of have to do it on faith and you have to do it for the love of the game, basically. And I would not have wanted to hear that. Um, Younger Johnny would have been like, you know, screw you. I'm going to be a millionaire. But (laughs) I would have kept doing it anyway, even if I heard that advice. And I think that that's a tough thing to hear because we all want to believe, you know, I want to get to the point someday when I'm only writing. I don't want to do this other stuff. I don't want to have my day job. And I know a bunch of writers who've quit a day job and then had to go back to it. And that's got to feel like a defeat. So I get that it's a tough road, but if you love it, if you're a storyteller, if you understand that stories really do change the world bit by bit, then I think it's a noble pursuit and you just have to do it for the love of it. It's not a very fun answer, but it's the truth. Fantastic. So where can people find you and everything you and Sterling and Stone do online? Uh, Well, if you're a producer, then we want to talk to you and make some movies with you. If you like fiction, just search Amazon or wherever for Johnny B. Truant. Sterling and Stone's website is sterlingandstone.net. But again, it's fiction focused. It's for readers at this point, but that's where we are. That's fantastic. Thanks so much for your time, Johnny. That was great. Thanks for having me, Joanne. It's always fun. So I hope you found the discussion with Johnny interesting. I certainly enjoyed it as my own life and career has also been uh, a lot of pivoting along the way. But I mean, I guess that's life, right? You'll rarely go from A to B, let alone to Z, (laughs) without a lot of pivots along the way as you change, as the world changes, as technology changes. Also, you can find all the non-fiction books by Johnny and Sean and Dave at smarterartist.net and also check out their fiction, such an impressive catalogue over at Sterling and Stone. So next Monday, I'll be talking to Dharma Kelleher about dealing with self-doubt and writer's block. So we'll be back to mindset topics. Happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.